welcome back to quantitative analysis in anthropology i'm professor peregrine and today we're going to talk about pearson's correlation coefficient we are on topic four and on correlation lesson two and so let's jump right in we're going to start by talking about pearson about carl pearson and one of the things that i want to do in this class is to make statistics um, apply to anthropology because one of the interesting things that I find about statistics is a lot of them were developed for anthropological problems and many of them were developed for the this uh, issue that I talked about earlier with Boaz's data set about does race explain variation or does culture Pearson was on the race side so he was a protege of one of the great thinkers of the 19th century, this man, Francis Galton. This is Carl Pearson, by the way. Francis Galton. Francis Galton was one of the great intellectuals of his time. He was president of uh, the Royal uh, Academy of Science. Um, he was a, a powerful political figure, a powerful scientific figure and a grotesque racist from our perspective. Pearson is an interesting person. Uh, he started out with a degree, I believe, in English. He became an attorney. Um, and during that period of his life, uh, until he was about 40, he seemed to have been sort of wandering. He didn't quite know what he wanted to do. He ultimately got interested in mathematics and statistics. He went to, to train at University College London under Francis Galton and became deeply attached to Galton, became um, almost to idolize Galton. And there was something to idolize there. Galton was an amazing figure. Galton uh, had begun thinking about issues of that we would today call correlation um, probably in the 1860s, maybe, maybe a bit later, 70s. But he put these issues to Pearson to try and develop further and to create the mathematical basis for what today we call correlation. And that's where Pearson's correlation coefficient comes in that we'll look at in a minute. He developed the mathematics behind correlation and regression and a number of other topics that we're going to look at. So in terms of the statistics we're going to look at, he's one of the most important figures. He became the first Galton Chair of Eugenics at University College London. Galton, when he passed away, gave a large amount of money to establish this chair. Eugenics. If you don't know that term, it's because it's become somewhat anathema following World War II and following the Nazis. Because what eugenics means is to breed human beings to be better, to actively breed human beings like we breed animals to select for desirable traits. The Nazis did that in, in attempting to create an Aryan race. What that ended up doing, as we all know, was to uh, an attempt to eliminate undesirable races. And clearly that was a bad thing. Um, and so eugenics sort of went out along with the, the final vestiges of race theory, which are unfortunately coming back today and, and are as inappropriate and unsupportable empirically uh, as they ever were. Race is a very important central concept in terms of social organization and in terms of culture but not in terms of biology. And we will be looking a little bit at that later on with a person named Fisher, uh, who is another person looking at genetics and race and uh, another holder of the Galton chair. 
Um, the Galton chair, by the way, became a Galton chair in evolutionary genetics, I believe, after World War II. Uh, but eugenics. Um, eugenics was a big movement. And so at the time, this Galton chair was not uh, controversial. And Pearson was the first to hold it. And what he did was to develop a lot of statistics for anthropometry, for measuring of humans. And we still use a lot of those statistics for anthropology, like the correlation coefficient. And we've seen one of these, right? Between age and height. We know there's a correlation there of about 0.9, as we saw in the last lesson. Uh, uh, sorry, as we're going to see in this lesson. <laughs> the last lesson we did see this. We saw the correlation between uh, age and height. We're going to find out that it's about 0.9, and, we'll, and I'll explain what that means. But it's a very strong relationship. Uh, and that's still used today by doctors to see if children are growing at the right rate. But there's lots of other... Um, elements of statistics that go into anthropometry and like I said we still use them today so there is sort of deep roots in anthropology through Pearson and through Galton and actually there's a key problem in one uh, in, in the study of variation of cultures that Galton came up with which is known as Galton's problem which has to do with an issue called autocorrelation or the non-independence of cases. And, and that's something we will get to when we talk about non-parametric statistics. Anyway, Pearson, very interesting person. Um, I might also point out just briefly that eugenics we're getting back into today in terms of CRISPR which is the ability to um, very carefully modify genetic material and the idea that we can build children uh, with desirable traits, that's basically eugenics. So it's, this has not actually gone away, it's coming back in a new form. And we should be thinking about that. Uh, it's a good thing that the biomedical community is very concerned about it, but we, as both anthropologists and people should think about that. Okay, off my high horse. I get on the high horse sometimes. Now I'm off it again, and we're going to talk about the Pearson correlation coefficient. Here it is. I said we weren't going to do very many uh, formulas in here. We're not going to do math in here. This is the last formula for a while. But this is not probably a difficult formula for you to understand because let's see what we've got. We've got a sum of some things over n. What's a sum of some things over n? It's an average. It's a mean. What are the things we have? Well, we have two z-scores. We have z-score on one variable, z-score on another variable multiplied together, all summed up and divided by n, in this case, n minus 1. We've talked about degrees of freedom before. Let's think about this. If one variable has a very high z-score, let's say 2, and another variable has a very high z-score, let's say 2, the product of those is 4. And if we keep getting large numbers divided by n, we're going to have a large number. If we have minus 2 and minus 2 multiplied together, that's also 4, correct? So if we have minus large numbers and positive large numbers, we're going to get a large number out of this. What if we have someone scoring <coughs> 2 on this variable and 0 z scores on that one? Well, then we get 0. And if that's a repeated pattern, we get a very low number. If we get a z-score of 2 and a z-score of minus 0.5, those multiplied together are, go are going to be minus 1 
It's a relatively low number. If we add them all together and divide, we're going to get a rel relatively no low number. So this cross product of z scores becomes big if their z score is high for both variables or the z scores are negative high, negative two, negative three on both variables. We get a big correlation coefficient. And think about that. That makes sense. There's an association that's strong if as one variable goes up in terms of z-score, the other variable goes up in terms of z-score. Or if as one variable goes down in z-score, the other variable goes down in z-score. Or if they change as one goes up, the other uh, goes down. So when we have those repeated patterns, this is going to get big and we're going to have a big value of R. Now, if they're both going down, we have, or, or as one goes up, the other goes down, this is going to be a negative number. If one is positive 2 and the other one's negative 2, so negative 2, positive 2, negative relationship, but negative 2 times positive 2 is negative 2, or negative 4. So this will, if there's a negative correlation, the R is going to be negative. If there's a positive correlation, the R is going to be positive. And it varies, it can only vary between minus 1 and 1. Let's look at some of these. This is what we were looking at before. This is age and stature from the BOAS data set. We have an R here of 0.93. That's a very strong correlation coefficient. The closer a correlation coefficient is to 1 or negative 1, the stronger it is. So this is very close to 1. And this is what we're looking for in terms of a scatter plot when we want to see a very strong correlation is this linear pattern. Now you might say, well, wait, there's all these outliers. It's not just everything on a line, but uh, these all tend to cancel each other out. And what we see is this very straight line through here, very strong pattern. This one's less strong, minus 4.47, because what we're getting is a pattern here running through here. It's not as obvious because there's a lot of outliers that are up above, but what's happening here is if you see this is a little bit darker uh, white, those are all the kids. And, oh, sorry, this is, this is age and uh, immigration year. So we looked at this in the last lesson. But these are all the kids, and it's kind of drawing that down. The correlation coefficient is sensitive to outliers. And so when you have a lot of outliers, it doesn't always work that well. And so this is one of the things about the correlation coefficient. If we look at this, this has a relatively strong correlation, but doesn't mean that much. And with all this variation, even though we have a, a relatively strong negative correlation, we have to ask, there's so much variation does that really mean that much? In terms of the strength of correlation, anything above about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 is very strong. Anything between about 0.3 and 0.6 is strong. Below about 0.3, it's weak to non-existent. That's for anthropology, for social science. In other sciences, you expect much, much stronger correlations in order to accept them as being strong or modest or weak. In social science, because our data tend to be very messy, we tend to have a lot of variation because of random error and because of observer error because or measurement error because a lot of the concepts we're working on are not that easily defined or that clearly defined. So there's some um, lack of reliability 
in them, in measuring them. So we tend to, in social science, have a lot of error, mostly random error. Uh, and so we, we accept lower correlation coefficients as being important because we know there's a lot of error in here. Okay, this is the adult. So here are the children up to age 21 and their stature, this very strong relationship. And remember we had with this that curvilinear relationship where we get to adulthood and then it levels out. Well, here's that leveling out. These are adults over 21 and their stature and there's nothing here. There's no correlation. The correlation coefficient is minus 0 0.02, 0 0.02, that's nothing. It's basically zero. There's no correlation. Now you might say, but Professor Peregrine, if we look through here, it looks like there's a linear relationship right through there. And that's exactly right, there is. What that linear relationship is, as you get older, your height doesn't change. That's not an association. That says this is a constant through age and that doesn't tell us anything. If it's a constant, it, it doesn't, there's no relationship here. Uh, age has no effect on height, height has no effect on age. Now it certainly does as you're growing up. Age and stature are strongly correlated. Your age has an effect on your height. Nothing here. Once you're fully grown, it doesn't change. Age no longer has any effect on your head. So when we get a correlation coefficient around zero, it means there's nothing going on. If we look at a scatter plot, we see a blob, it means there's nothing going on. If we look at a scatter plot, we see something that looks like a line, then we have an association of interest. Pearson correlation coefficient is the most widely used we're going to use it all the time. We're going to see in the next topic a very powerful analytical technique called regression. And that's based on Pearson correlation coefficient. So it's an important thing to remember, this average cross product of the z-scores. But there are other correlation coefficients out there for other types of data. So one of the types of data we are going to use a lot in here is ordinal data, again in part because we use scales of highly disagree to highly agree or strongly disagree to strongly agree, and because the concepts that we're trying to measure are often difficult to measure, they're much easier to measure on an ordinal scale, or they're impossible to measure on an inter in interval scale, so we use ordinal variables a lot. To do correlation on ordinal variables, as we'll learn later in the course, I seem to say that a lot, we'll learn later in the course, but we will. We're going to talk about what are called non-parametric statistics, and we will learn about ordinal correlation. Instead of using the z-scores, you use ranks. And the two most common ordinal correlation coefficients we'll come across are Spearman's row and Kendall's tau. Kendall's tau comes in two flavors, tau b and tau c. I don't know what happened to tau a. Uh, these are, are both very useful. They produce slightly different results. I, I kind of like Kendall's tau for, for reasons that I won't go into. It, I like it better, it seems to make more sense to me when I see relationships. But those are good correlation coefficients. We will again talk about those for ordinal variables. There is a correlation coefficient, and actually there are several uh, if you, that we can talk about, but the one that's most commonly used for nominal variables is called the phi coefficient. I've always heard it called phi. It's spelt phi. And this is the Greek letter phi. Uh, so I don't know why I've always heard it referred to as phi, and I may just be wrong. But I, I call it the phi coefficient. And if we look at that, here's two nominal variables. And the phi coefficient, uh, 
works with dichotomous variables. Um, if we if we actually can do an ordinal regression with a dichotomous variable and an ordinal variable, uh, just like we can do, uh, sorry, a correlation, just like we can do a correlation with ordinal variables. But phi coefficient is useful for dichotomous variables, and you can sort of see on this little chart or this little table why that would be. If on whatever variables we have, we map them out, this is yes, no, and yes, no, or something. Uh, we can see that we have the yeses and the nos, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. If someone says yes on one, they tend to say yes on the other. If they say no on one, they tend to say no on the other. And what we can see here is there's like a line. These are really big values, and those are really small values. It's that same kind of thing. So we can do a kind of correlation with nominal variables. And like I said, the phi coefficient is one, or phi coefficient. And there are some others that we will talk about later in the course, as I'm always saying, when we talk about uh, chi-square, another statistic. And then there's a very interesting and important form of correlation that I'm going to throw into the discussion of regression that's called partial correlation. Partial correlation mathematically is much more complicated than the simple Pearson's R correlation coefficient, but it's basically this. If you have two variables that are related because there's some underlying variable, and we can think of age and stature as having a strong relationship because of an underlying variable having to do with growth, then you can sort of correct the, the one correlation that you're seeing, like between age and stature, by what's called controlling for changes in the underlying variable. And sometimes the pattern becomes stronger, sometimes it becomes weaker, and that's called partial correlation, where you control for some underlying variable. We call that a control variable, or a mitigating variable, or a mediating variable. And uh, uh, we're going to cover that a little bit when we get to regression, because I, I think that works better in a form that's called multiple regression. Uh, but just be aware, you will see in literature partial correlation, and what that means is a correlation with an underlying control or mediating variable, and you're controlling for that variable. And you're going to see it more frequently in something called uh, multiple regression. Okay, that's it for this lesson. We'll see you next time.